Okay. Um, well, welcome everyone who is uh, who's coming into this Zoom talk. Um, this is the fourth talk in the summer speaker series hosted by the University of Oregon's Labor Education and Research Center, along with the Oregon AFL-CIO. Um, my name is Gordon Lafer. I'm a, one of the faculty members at LERC and also a member of the school board here in Eugene. And you know the the bad side of COVID is we have to do all these things by Zoom. And the good thing is it's enabled us to hear from some very high level national leaders who we might not have gotten to see in person in Oregon, but who have generously joined us on Zoom. And tonight is one of those great opportunities. Uh, we're very privileged to have Diane Ravitch uh, with us tonight from New York. She's one of the country's foremost thinkers, speakers, and strategists about education policy, founder of the Network for Public Education, which is a national organization dedicated to fighting against test-driven corporate education reform. She is a professor at New York University School of Education and formerly served as assistant secretary for the U.S. Department of Education. Her most recent book is called Slaying Goliath, The Passionate Resistance to Privatization and the Fight to Save American Schools, and her education blog at dianeravich.com, D-I-A-N-E-R-A-V-I-T-C-H.com, is one of the nation's most widely respected voices on education policy. So thank you so much for being here with us tonight, Diane. Then, thank, thank you, Gordon. It's, it's .net, by the way. Oh, .net. Thank you so much for correcting me. I apologize for steering people to the wrong place. dianeravich.net. Um, also with us tonight is Lisa Gorley. Lisa Gorley is a longtime special education assistant at Sweet Home High School and a city councilor in Sweet Home. She is a member of the National Program and Policy Council of the American Federation of Teachers and is president of the Oregon School Employees Association, representing 20,000 educational employees across the state, including educational assistants, custodians, bus drivers, food service workers, and administrative support staff. And finally, we're also lucky to have John Larson. John Larson is a, high, a longtime high school English teacher in Hermiston and is president of the Oregon Education Association, which represents 44,000 educators across the state, including almost all of the elementary, middle, and high school teachers in public schools. Finally, Jennifer Smith, uh, unseen but critical in the background, is Lurk's department manager and will be monitoring questions from the chat function. So the way we're gonna do this is for the first half hour, I'll ask the panelists questions and they'll get to talk about different things. And then in the second half hour, Jennifer will pull out questions from the chat function. So anyone who has a question, feel free starting now to write something in the, in the chat part of this. And then the second half of the hour will be devoted to answering those questions. So um, I want to start with you, Diane, which is um, heading into an, you know, we're headed into an unprecedented fall where most learning will be done online. The private companies who sell digital learning apps are salivating at this opportunity to expand their market, but a lot of other people warn of the dangers of online learning. So I wanted to start with a kind of general question, which is what do we really know about online education? Is it any good? And given that we have to use it, what's the best way to use it? Um, well, thank you, Gordon, and let me say that I'm very happy to be with you, and uh, I was on an NEA panel just a few days ago, and I recommended that everyone read your book, The 1% Solution. I think it's a, a seminal book in the field of education in terms of helping people understand what's going on beneath the surface. Um, I think the important thing to understand is that we are in uncharted waters. No one actually knows what they're doing. And so anyone who speaks with any great assurance about what the future holds is, in my opinion, blowing smoke because the reality is we don't know. Uh, what we do know is that we're in uh, the midst of a global pandemic, uh, that the uh, infection rate in the United States is incredible. I mean, we have, I think, uh, about 160,000 dead, 5 million cases. The numbers continue to grow. Uh, and where do, what do we do with schooling? Uh, I think we're, we're, we're stepping gingerly into this pond because these are children, there are children, in my case, my grandchildren. Uh, I'm very nervous about the going back to school part. Um, my son, who's a parent of my grandchildren, is less nervous than I am. Um, but I, what we know about online learning is that we've learned a lot in the last six months. Uh, the first is that a lot of children 
never log in. So that we are seeing a growing inequities as a result of being forced to use online learning. We knew before the pandemic that online lear learning was inadequate uh, because we have a number of uh, virtual charter schools and they have a record. And their record is that when children are in virtual charter schools, uh, they lose motivation. Uh, they uh, are likely to uh, drop out, to um, not pay attention. The, the online learning schools, the virtual charter schools, have very, very low graduation rates, and this is true across the country. Uh, many of the online charters, which are now marketing their services very heavily, uh, are operated for profit, and they do make a very large profit, but their educational record is very, very poor. So um, I'd say that one of the things we've learned from this past six months is that online learning uh, is really a, a very poor alternative, but it's the, in, in most cases, it's the only one we have. And if you have to make a choice between sending your child to a school when it's not safe, um, it, then you have to stick with online learning. Uh, but you, you do so knowing that it's, a, it's, it's the best of a lot of bad alternatives. Uh, and I don't think we're going to come out of this one day uh, with a huge new audience for online learning. I think we will come out of this one day understanding that the best alternative is having a real teacher with real experience and a commitment to education uh, in, uh, who is working in a classroom uh, and making eye contact, eye contact with his or her students and having vigorous discussions in the classroom. And that's what we all miss so very much right now. Uh, if it can happen safely, it should happen. Uh, but I personally am, am not uh, feeling comfortable that we're ready for this because frankly, even where there's a low positivity rate and New York City right now has a positivity rate that is uh, the percentage that tests positive for the virus. After having gone through the worst part of the virus with uh, the highest death rate in the country, uh, we now have a positivity rate under 1%, which is possibly the best in the country. And still there are parents and teachers who feel that it's not safe because we can look around the world and see that other countries that thought they had the virus licked started school and then saw it come back again. So I'm still, um, call me a nervous Nellie and I'll accept the, uh, the name very willingly. Uh, I'm still uncomfortable about plunging in, um, and I don't want to. I, I don't want to put anyone's life at risk. Um, but I also know that there are terrible trade-offs to be made in terms of loss of learning time, inequities, uh, kids not logging on at all. All of these negative things are happening. Uh, but number one, above all, is uh, so uh, health and safety. Mm -hmm. So if I could just follow up with one, one more question, Diane, about that. So given, that, assuming that in Oregon now, everything is opening up online, and even just within, you know, doing the best we can online, there's a, a debate that I see a lot of places, including in my, the school board that I'm part of, which is there are people who say our big concern should be about students falling behind or staying on track. And that means we should drill them in basic math and English scores to make sure they, you know, their test scores keep up. But other than, young students who need to learn basic reading and math or high school juniors and seniors who need to get certain things done to go to college or start careers, it's not clear what falling behind means. And there are other teachers and parents saying that in this time, teachers should be empowered to get creative about engaging kids with things they can do from home, like home repair, gardening, baking, studying their pets or other things that might be more engaging than memorizing who did what in the Lewis and Clark expedition, even if they're not part of the curriculum. What do you think for the period that we are online, what do you think education should look like during this period, or what should we be aiming at? Well, you know, I, I take the lead from some of the people I respect most, like uh, David Berliner, uh, Jean Glass, both of, both of them very highly revered education researchers, and they say, we should just forget about the test scores for the coming year. This is, this is an unusual year, um, and it's a, it's a time where we should think about different ways of learning. Uh, I, I don't think we're going to go back to the way things were. I hope we don't. 
uh, I hope that in the coming year that we don't have Betsy DeVos making decisions about our children's futures, um, and nor the gang of um, Walton-funded people that she has surrounding her. Uh, they worship test scores. And I think that this is a time where we have to think about how can we get kids engaged in, in doing things that are interesting to them? How can we get them engaged in um, projects uh, and exploring whether they're uh, in nature projects? I think it's a time where teachers can draw on their innate creativity, forget about the test, forget about the test scores, and focus on how can we continue learning that's self-directed. And the only way that's going to happen is if we draw on um, intrinsic motivation. I mean, the, the tests are really a way of holding a whip over kids' heads, and we don't have that whip right now. We won't have it for a long time. So the most important thing to me, in my mind, is for educators now to call upon their innate creativity, innovation, uh, ingenuity, and think about ways in which kids can become involved in projects, even when they're at home uh, or uh, communicating online, where they're doing research online, where they're doing research in their backyard or, or doing research in a local park, uh, and are reading. I mean, there's lots of opportunities to read, and there's also opportunity to learn about, about history. I don't think that history is dry. I think history is very exciting. So there, there are wonderful opportunities that don't involve test scores, and we're all challenged uh, to find them and get kids turned on to the excitement of learning. Great, thank you. Um, Lisa Gorley, if I could ask you a question, which is um, from the point of view of, of uh, educational assistants and other um, school support staff who play some of the most critical roles and shoulder some of the most critical responsibilities in education, my question is partly like, what safety conditions do you think have to be in place for it to be safe for schools to reopen in person? And particularly for, for school support staff, while teachers now are largely recognized as able to teach from home, there's more pressure for educational assistants, administrative support employees, and other classified staff to either be doing their work at, in person at school bu buildings or to be laid off, which puts the highest health risk on the lowest paid educational employees. Is there, from what you see, critical and important work that these employees could be doing from home that would help meet the needs of students during the school closures? Well, first is to ensure the physical distancing with real plans that involve those workers at the sites, the workers that actually do the work in that environment so they feel safe. When the numbers of cases are low enough, then review it on a site-by-site -site basis. We need the infrastructure to support adequate testing, tracing, and isolation of new cases, both in the schools and the, the communities to identify virus spread, where it's occurring, so districts and staffs know how and when to adjust educational strategies. Each site location should absolutely need um, effective, adequate PPE and ongoing sanitation that addresses their needs. Finally, we need the investment in to an effective response for public health regarding our schools, our universities, our hospitals, and our communities. Um, we've got to have the most professional and effective recovery possible when it's time education needs to hit the ground running. We don't want to lose any more time than necessary playing catch up than we already do. Um, to make this happen, we need the staff to be in place. We need office workers, food service, specialists, tech personnel, drivers, custodians, IAs, and all of those people that make our schools effective. That's exactly why retaining these folks is crucial. These workers are experienced, trained, and ready for when we return to our jobs. Part of that retaining these work, this workforce is not harming them as well. Otherwise, we lose our standing workforce. We need the employees that work in areas like service, excuse me, food service especially, as the economy suffers. We have kids that the only meal that they get is the ones that they receive from school. And as the economy continues to suffer, this need is gonna to continue to increase. We need to continue supporting distance learning, repair buildings, sanitize work sites, 
We need to support the structure of various forms of team engagement between our districts, ESDs, our students and their families. We need our nurses to reach out to our students and their families to see how they're doing, to problem solve, to help them access resources that they need. Even transportation, because the drivers can provide hotspots with their buses for the students that don't have internet access. We know that in extremely rural areas, they've been doing this for years, so it works. There's no question it's in the best interest of our community to retain our school staff, utilizing them wherever it's possible, where it's safe. Thank you. Thank you, I, I really appreciate it. I know as a school board member, the way, to be, um, the way to make bad decisions is to not talk to the people who are actually doing the daily work in the schools and understand what things look like on the ground. So uh, I really appreciate that perspective. Um, I wanted to ask you, John Larson, the next question, which is, um, lat and this is kind of related to COVID, but not, not entirely. Um, last year, Oregon teachers conducted a statewide strike to help win more money for education. But even with that added funding, which I, I think was just recently uh, assured to be kept in place by the legislature, and even before the coronavirus hit, per student funding in Oregon was way below where it was in 2008 before the financial crisis, and even further below where it was in the 1990s. Oregon's a much richer state now than it was in the 1990s, so why are we spending less on education? Most importantly, how much more should we be spending, and who should be paying for that? Where should that money come from? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for that question. So uh, before the uh, Student Success Act passed last uh, last um, um, May, or well, I guess it was yeah, in in May, um, we were we were about two billion dollars per biennium short of being able to adequately fund education based on the quality education model. In the 1970s, corporate income tax made up about 17 percent of the general fund budget. Uh, before the Student Success Act, it made up about 7% of the, of the state's uh, general fund budget. Um, even with the Student Success Act, um, our corporations are still going to be ranked in the 40s uh, for corporate tax in this, in this country. Uh, so we absolutely need to fund our schools at a, at a greater level. Um, so the, the governor did a great job of keeping the state school fund intact which was actually at, this, at the current service level from last year. The Student Success Act that was going to add $2 billion to our schools is not necessarily intact uh, because it was based on a, on a corporate activities tax that we're not going to recognize based on the economy that's happening. So there'll be a little bit of money that maybe comes in, but a lot of it's been used to backfill uh, the general fund, the state school fund this year. And so what we're looking at is a budget that is the, the current service level of last year with the needs of this year, which are going to be woefully inadequate. Uh, and so, um, you know, we, we need to be taxing our corporations. They need to be paying their fair share. You know, during this pandemic, um, a lot of our small businesses definitely have been impacted, but businesses like Walmart and Amazon, uh, you know, where, where people are, are just, uh, um, their business is exploding. They need to be paying their fair share. They should be helping to uh, to prop up the system at this particular moment. Great, thank you. So here's a, a question that any of you um, could answer that I think is really hard to figure out what to do with um, and relates both to what you just said, John, and what you said earlier, Lisa, which is schools end up serving a lot of needs that it's not obvious that those should be the school system's needs. Like one of those is, as you said, Lisa, a lot of kids you know, only get their reliable meals at school. There are a lot of kids who only get um, mental health at school or who only get access to a nurse at school. You know, if we were a different kind of country, this, you wouldn't say, oh, this is the school system's responsibility, but here we are. So one of the, I think, really hard questions is we're going to online education. There are a lot of families where the parents have to work and they can't leave their kids home alone. If we were a country like, you know, most of Western Europe, the government would be paying people enough money to, to stay home and, and be safe without having to put their incomes at risk. But then we have families who may be at risk of losing their jobs, their health insurance, their, their homes even. So given that um, you know, this shouldn't feel, fall to the school system, but it kind of does, what should we do about that in the period of school closures? How should we think about the needs of those families and, and what can be done? Anybody who, who wants to weigh in on this? 
I, I'm happy to start, Gordon. I, uh, I think that um, um, number one, it's going to be about connections and how we make connections with students and families during this time. Um, in the springtime, we know that, uh, that as many as 20 or 30 percent of students didn't connect online, I think as, uh, as Diane was saying or, or Lisa was saying earlier, and, and we need to do better than that. Uh, and I know that uh, teachers and uh, our education support professionals are classified have been working through the summer to try and figure out how to do that. Uh, and I know our schools have been working throughout the summer to figure out how to do that. And, and we need to be able to, um, we need to be able to rethink how we do education in this state. And so in order to make those connections, if, the, if jobs uh, you know, such as uh, instructional assistants are, are not going to be able to be utilized as instructional assistants, we can use uh, those same people to help make those connections, to help be making the phone calls home, trying to uh, work with the parents, doing translation services, um, working to make sure that people have health care, have food security, that we get meals to the right families. And so we, we maybe don't have the same jobs in our school system that we had before the pandemic, but there are definitely lots of jobs that have been created. Uh, we're going to need contact tracers. We're going to need uh, people to keep logs of, of infection, things like that, once we go back in person. And I think that our schools uh, need to be thinking about that and value their employees uh, to, to uh, accomplish all of those tasks. We definitely need to look at it as a community school approach and rethink what our schools are providing. And mental health is, is huge. It's emotional health is really important. Um, affordable child care that's effective and obtainable, safe for people, that's crucial to restarting our economy. And all of these things need to be looked at and on the table. Yeah, I, Gordon, I think that one of the things that we've learned as a result of the pandemic is how central the public schools are to the community. And we've gone through a long period of time where uh, we've had had talked from these kind of right-wing libertarians about a backpack full of cash and kids uh, taking their money and going somewhere else. And what that does is to make the community as a whole weaker because it parcels out the money to a, a lot of different providers, none of whom are as capable as the public school of meeting the diverse needs that students have for social, emotional, mental, psychological, all kinds of services, including food services. And I, I guess the one thing that right now that bugs me the most is the idea that at a time where internet access has become crucial to life, uh, that families have to pay for it. And it's one thing to say, well, you can get it on the bus, that's great, but why shouldn't it be free for everyone? I, I don't understand why internet access is different from let's say access to AM, FM radio. I can turn on my radio and I don't have to pay anyone anything to listen to AM, FM. Why do I have to pay for internet access? Why should anyone have to pay for it? This has now become a crucial uh, link to, to the world and I think it should be free. Great, thank you. So, so let me ask you, uh, kind of building on that, Diane, as somebody who's looked at this as a national issue, um, if you can say some about, you know, what is the federal government doing? What is the federal government failing to do? What should they be doing? And thinking about what, that, what the role could be or should be at that level in terms of addressing this, particularly if the coronavirus crisis goes on for another year and it's not just this fall? Well, it's a frightening thought, but it, it, it could happen because uh, while there's a lot of talk of vaccines, we don't know when there will be one that is real. And we don't know once there is there are one or more that are effective, how long it will take to get it out to everyone. Um, the, what the federal government is doing is basically nothing. Uh, all we have from the federal government right now is uh, hectoring, uh, telling schools they should open fully, whether they have the money to do it or not. Uh, and in the meanwhile, the federal government, I'm speaking specifically of, of President Trump and Secretary DeVos, uh, have refused to do anything to make the funding available to schools uh, to have the equipment that they need to open safely. Uh, to open safely requires a lot of expense and it requires social distancing, which may mean reducing class size to 10 or 12, uh, or depending on the size of the classroom. It means having a good ventilation system. Uh, 
excuse my dog in the background. Uh, it, it means uh, having the personal protective equipment. It means uh, having the nurses available so the temperatures can be checked whenever necessary. It's expensive to operate schools in, in the middle of a pandemic, even when the infection rates are low, because we can't be sure that they won't go back up again. But the, in order to do that, I've seen various estimates from national organizations, uh, the superintendents' organizations, national school boards, other groups that have said it could be anywhere from 300 to 400 billion dollars to ensure that schools are fully equipped uh, to open. And yet the federal government, the leadership of the federal government says, open the schools. Donald Trump tweeted three words, all caps, open the schools. He has not proposed a nickel of extra funding. In fact, he's blocked the funding. The, the House of Representatives passed legislation called the HEROES Act that included funding for schools and the Senate simply refuses to take it up. Uh, so the money is not there, it's not forthcoming. And you, there is no advocacy coming from uh, the Department of Education, uh, the Secretary of Education or the President uh, saying we need to have money to make sure our kids are safe. They're simply saying open the schools and we don't care what happens. And in those states that have taken the President's advice like Florida, Georgia, um, and Tennessee, they've seen surging rates of the virus. Uh, so this is, they have abdicated all leadership. Okay, thanks for that uh, cheery analysis. Um, before we go to questions for the, from the audience, I wanted to ask um, both of you, Lisa Gorley and John Larson, um, one last question. Um, which is, I think that most people have a hard time, most people don't know what teachers and instructional assistants or educational assistants and other educators do every day, even during regular times, and all the more during, during COVID. So I just wanted to ask if you could talk some about like, how much does it take, what does it really take to convert a class from being in person to trying to do it online or other kinds of educational services? Um, how hard is it, you know, when we're talking about, everybody says, well, one of the big things we need to do in school is to you know, create community. So last, you know, in April and May, educators were trying to maintain a community that had been built over six or seven months before that. Now in September, everybody's going to be trying to create those relationships from scratch. So I guess my question is, how do, how do you, what does it take to convert education to online how do you possibly build relationships or community that way? And is the idea of hybrid, uh, some kind of hybrid schedule where we would simultaneously be giving in-person classes and online classes reasonable when you think about what does it really take to do these things? So any part of that that you can illuminate just to give listeners an idea of what does this really look like in the daily life of educators? Lisa, do you wanna, do you wanna go first or you want me to go first? Go ahead, it's a big one. All right, so um, it, it, was that saying that you wanted me to go first? Like, I'm sorry. That's fine. Okay, That's fine. great. Um, so, you know, it's, it's teaching is really the same skill set, only you need, to put, you need to layer on a, um, a technical skill set as well. Um, one of the problems we had last spring is that every district was using different platforms and even sometimes within the same district uh, they were using different platforms and so uh, both teachers and parents had to learn multiple platforms trying to figure out how to do school uh, and that that was uh, definitely a difficult uh, thing to do but on a daily basis at school not only are you trying to teach your curriculum but you're involved in uh, uh, trying to maintain discipline in the classroom, you're uh, building relationships with students, um, you, you're often their, you know, their uh, confidant, their nurse, their, uh, all of the different things that, uh, that students need in the schools. And trying to do all of those things online, I think, has been a, a real challenge for people, uh, especially when the students aren't connecting. And as you say, as we start this school year, um, we're trying to build that community, build those relationships as opposed to maintain them. And that's gonna be really difficult too. I've heard of a number of schools that are doing some one-to-one uh, -one meetings with parents and students uh, right at the beginning of the year so that the students can meet their, meet their teachers. But even then, you know, a lot of the teachers and a lot of the parents are nervous about even uh, a conversation like that and the safety behind that. 
So it's going to take a lot of, it's going to take the entire school system to pull together uh, to make sure that, that students and parents feel connected to the system. Thank you. Go ahead, Lisa. I think it's a completely different environment and skill set to engage kids on a screen that you used to be able to just your presence of moving around the classroom and looking over their shoulder to make sure they they're getting it that comprehension check and seeing their faces right up there with you so that they feel comfortable asking questions you know how difficult it's been for the adults to be able to manage themselves and learn the technology and to be able to get things turned in it's really hard for kids to have all the destruction going on with our economy and the crises of dealing with the pandemic and not knowing what that means, the social issues within their household, and get online and to have this engagement and be responsible for getting that homework in when they really, they have parents that um, aren't English speakers. They have parents that don't understand trig and calculus. And we really do need strong homework support. We need people reaching out for comprehension checks. We need to give them that support that they need to, um, because frankly, our teachers can't do it all. They just keep getting more dumped on them and more dumped on them. And they're trying to manage their curriculum, watching what their kids are doing, and to do everything. And it's like playing whack-a-mole. And you just can't do it all. And so they, we need teams. And we need to move forward. And the longer we do this through this year, the better we're going to get at it. But we still have to keep following up with these kids because they're fragile. And we need to help them come out on the other side as strong as possible. And, and it's difficult. And we need to have patience with that. But at the same time, we did get a practice run last year. And um, so we're going to be able to hit the ground better this time than what we did before. We've learned some lessons. And we need to take those lessons with us as we move forward. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, some of the things I've heard as a board member when you were talking about the importance of teams is the importance of teams between teachers and classified employees of having, I mean, even what we're doing right now where, where Jennifer Smith is monitoring the questions on chat while we're having this conversation. We're making phone calls to families, doing some of the outreach to families that one person can't do. So uh, thanks very much for that. I'm gonna turn it over to Jennifer Smith now to tell us what, what questions were coming in from the audience that we should be responding to. A few questions and definitely welcome more as um, you're piquing everyone's curiosity about what we're gonna do. A lot of unknowns. One um, idea that Georgianne Jones, an OSEA member, has um, expanding on John's comments why are we not surveying our classified employees to ask them about previous job experiences, interests, and other skills? We may find we have someone to help with web design, another with computer repair or specialized office skills, all sorts of things. I agree with organizational consultant Peter Drucker on allowing workers to use their strengths and interests in their work, which will bring more satisfaction to all. And I'm wondering, or maybe she's wondering how we can advocate for that. And is it appropriate to advocate for that? Lisa, do you want to respond to that first? Absolutely. We have a lot of workers that this isn't their first career. Even as um, classified, we have people who are certified teachers within our numbers that are not working as certified teachers. And um, we have people about all kinds of previous careers and talents, and it, it would be nice if their administrators knew what their resources really were out there. I think it's a brilliant idea. John, any thoughts? Yeah, I think it's uh, absolutely vital that we advocate for, for that type of a system. Um, we, we just can't look at schooling the same way right now as we looked at it pre-COVID, and I hope uh, we don't look at it the same way uh, when we return to some semblance of normal either. Um, I think we completely undervalue and underutilize our classified employees and we, uh, we need to be um, working as a team. And, and that also means we need to start paying our classified employees a living wage, uh, which I don't believe that we do well right now. Okay, and Diane, I wanted to ask you, I don't know if there's um, 
any place in the country. I was, we're kind of like in this fall, try, kind of trying to reinvent education online. And that part of that is also reinventing staffing and, and teamwork and stuff like that. Is there any place that you've seen that you think, oh, this principal or this superintendent or this group of educators have a good idea and this is how we could think about using people in the, in the fall in a different way? Uh, Gordon, to be honest, I, ha I have not seen it. I think that um, th there's a kind of a national mood of people being stunned. You know, like we're, we're in a situation we've never been in before. Uh, the, the usual guardrails have been taken away. And we're expected, teachers are expected, parents are expected to do things they've never done before. And everyone's feeling their way. I think we've learned some things over the past six months. I think what, what parents have learned is that they're not very good teachers. <laughs> and I think the teachers perhaps feel more appreciated, but at the same time, they don't want to go back into a situation where, where they're being asked to risk their life and to go into classrooms without having all the necessary protections that the scientists tell us are required. And most school districts don't have the resources to provide the necessary protections. But I have yet to see, I've seen lots of examples of wealthy districts putting up plastic barriers, basically wrapping student places in plastic barriers. There are very few schools that can afford to do that. Um, so we're still feeling our way. Thank you. Jennifer, you have a next question? Well, kind of off of what Diane had said earlier about uh, funding towards schools um, not being adequate and there being so much more need this year, and kind of in the vein of flight attendants having been crucial in uh, making sure that cabin air is recirculated and, um, you know, is fresh for their own safety, I wonder if teachers um, have a role to play. Uh, Rosetta uh, Benucci had, from IATSE has asked, um, have the school buildings and school district offices uh, across the state, have their HVAC systems been checked? And you know, what role can um, educators and parents uh, play in encouraging that? And without proper funding, maybe it's not possible, but what can we do to at least make sure we have healthy air? Anybody have something well, to say about this? One thought that I have heard repeatedly, Gordon, is uh, outdoor education. And this is something that has both pluses and minuses. If it's raining, you can't have outdoor education. You can, on the other hand, uh, put up tents at not a great expense, as long as it's not very, very cold or very, very hot. Uh, but I, there are some schools uh, in New York and elsewhere that have been um, exploring to what extent can they have kids outdoors and have their, have their lessons in the park uh, or even close off streets uh, where, where the parks are not available just because of the necessity of having ventilation. And there's a big problem because many schools that were built in a, in a different era were built without windows. And that's the worst possible environment in which to conduct a classroom uh, because they neither have adequate ventilation nor can they open the windows. There are also schools, by the way, that have windows that haven't been opened in decades. So those are some of the problems. But I, I think that everyone who wants to have a safe environment has to be concerned with the ventilation. That's crucial. And I had a post on my blog, I think this morning, from a teacher who said the great scandal in American schools is how many schools were built years and years ago without adequate ventilation and they're really not, uh, they're not, not at a point where they can be ventilated for the, for the current situation. So go outdoors if you can. John or Lisa, do you know of any district that's doing, that's doing things in a good way that we should be paying attention to? I've not heard of any districts that are necessarily doing anything with ventilation other than keeping windows open if they have windows. Um, but I think this really brings to the fore um, the problem we have with bonding in this state for local school infrastructure, uh, because the wealthier districts where people are willing to pay taxes for, for newer facilities, uh, newer buildings, they tend to have buildings with, with more windows, more daylighting, uh, more uh, better ventilation. 
But then you have uh, districts who haven't been able to pass a bond in 70 years um, where their buildings were built in the 1930s and the 1940s. And just as Diane was saying, with no windows or, uh, you know, they were already having infrastructure problems. I think we know about the lead in the water in the Portland Public Schools. Uh, I think we've seen, you know, mold in buildings uh, that have made people sick. And, and we haven't fixed those problems, let alone the ventilation problems for COVID. Um, I think outdoor, you know, I've heard the same thing about uh, teaching outdoors. I think that that's, that's certainly an option in some places uh, until, of course, in Oregon, the rain starts on the west side of the state. And in, in August and September, and, and again in the spring in the east side of the state, um, the heat is just uh, unbearable. So you wouldn't necessarily be able to do a whole lot uh, outdoors uh, there either. But, but we can also start thinking about what other buildings uh, in private industry could be utilized uh, if they're not being utilized uh, as space right now um, because of COVID and, and the work from home. Um, you know, in private industry, are there newer buildings that, that uh, um, they might donate to the school system to utilize during this time? And if so, can we find a way to uh, uh, lower the transportation costs or at least pay for the transportation costs to get students to those, to those facilities uh, with better ventilation? Uh, but I think we, we continue to think of our schools like we've always thought of them and we have to bring kids to the school um, and, you know, maybe it means we bring the teacher to the students in a neighborhood. Uh, we, find a, we find a good pl a place with good ventilation in a neighborhood and we, we go to the students. Uh, I mean, we really got to start thinking about things differently. Yeah. Jennifer, what's next? Well, I have an opportunity here to ask a question that I'm concerned about. And that is um, around, you know, if schools, if the, if the state decides that the the risk is such that it's time to reopen schools, I'm kind of more of a mind of, for instance, Diane or people in New York who, even if it's, you know, less than 1% um, positivity rate, I live in a multi-generational house. I really wouldn't risk my father's life for um, my high schooler to go to school. Um, I don't want to enroll him in a virtual school. And I saw an article in the Oregonian talking about, um, you know, the cap of 3% of um, students that can attend virtual schools as if it was some accidental oversight or something that just it would be a quick fix to get rid of that cap. Um, I, I guess it's sort of a jumbled question, but I'm just concerned that if schools do reopen, I'm risk averse enough to not want to enroll in a virtual school, what options would I have um, and how can I help um, my public school um, employees, um, you know, fight against privatization in that way? Anybody have a thought on this? Well, you know, Gordon, I think it's a time where probably you should jump in and talk about the fact that there are corporations, there are for-profit for groups that see this crisis as an opportunity. And um, early on in the COVID, Naomi Klein wrote uh, a scary and brilliant article about how there are ed tech companies salivating at the chance to grab a bigger market share. And uh, I've heard from different parts of the country about these uh, virtual schools uh, increasing their advertising budget, thinking that they can seize more and more of the student enrollment. Um, and similarly, there has been a move, and I've heard this um, possibly about Betsy DeVos, that this might be an opportunity to, to send uh, federal money and public money to homeschoolers. Although I'm not sure that homeschoolers actually want federal money because there's always the risk for them that there might be some accountability, which they've always resisted. But it, it's just amazing to me. I, I think every day that I open my email, I see something from some libertarian or right-wing group uh, about, uh, well, now we can abandon public schools because of COVID, and we can send public money to private schools, we can send public money to uh, religious schools, uh, and we can have more money for uh, distance learning and so forth. And it's like uh, exploiting a tragedy uh, for profit making, but it's happening. And we have to be very wary of that and protect public education because if there's anything that comes through to me about this crisis, 
it's that the public schools are, are central to the community and that when they reopen, as they will eventually, they have to be better than ever and they have to have more resources than they had in the past. Teachers have to be paid better. Or everyone who works in schools has to be valued as a, an important member of the community and they have to be recognized for what they are, which is a major connective tissue in the community that pulls people together around the future of our children. Yeah, I can, Jennifer, I can actually say a couple things about that. I mean, as Diane mentioned, there has been a big increase in advertising by the, the big for-profit corporations that run the biggest chains of private online charter schools, which here in Oregon, we have a limited enrollment to 3% of total student enrollment. So it's the big chains like K-12 Inc. and Connections Academy, which are here, are not able to capitalize it quite as capitalize on this crisis quite as much as they are in other states. You know what I've heard from um, from parents is in your situation who don't want to send their kids to school even if school's open, but don't really want that kind of you know totally standardized test driven education. And what they want is the kind of things that we're trying to put together this fall, which is a class that's online but with the regular teacher from their regular school and with other kids who are their their kids' peers in the class. And I think that if we go back to school, that what, you know, one of the things we need to look at is figuring out, is there a critical mass of interest from parents to do that, to have a track of that that is available where we're not sending kids off to the big for-profit online charter schools, but saying, okay, maybe there's, you know, there's enough for one class in a school, or we're going to have a combined fourth and fifth grade or something like that, because I think there are a lot of uh, enough parents in that situation that it would be good in school districts to provide an option for that within the public school system, particularly building on, you know, if we figure something out this fall that enables that, that kind of teaching to look even better than it did last spring, that's an option that we could keep. I, Lisa, I would add, Gordon, I hadn't seen any school who created a plan that didn't have some sort of a virtual option for students if they wanted it. So even the schools that were saying we're going back 100% in-person learning, they also created a, a virtual option for parents who didn't feel comfortable sending their, their students back to school. I think it's important that we remember that if we withdraw our children from their local school, that school won't get that funding and then it affects the community. And if we want our neighbor's children to be educated, which enriches our community, and we need to be part of that experience and we need to have an advocate for our kids because those corporations, they don't care if your kids get educated. They just want your money. And we need to remember that. They're not our friend. They're weakening our communities and our kids. And it, it's a serious issue right now. But again, we can't send our kids back into a flu Petri dish. You know, we need to make sure that everybody's safe. But our, my own school is providing the option online or hybrid, so. So Gordon, just anecdotally yesterday, uh, we heard at least one school uh, district board that voted to lift their own 3% cap um, to allow their students to uh, fly from their school, which I think is completely irresponsible of, of the school board, but uh, I think indicative of where some of the minds of uh, the right-wing individuals that Diane was talking about are, are right now. Gordon, I think you're muted. In Oregon, it's about $10,000 per student if a student chooses to go to uh, either to homeschool or to, uh, to go to a private online charter school. So it, it quickly becomes amounts of money that start to really um, make it difficult for school districts to provide the services to the rest of the students who are remaining there. Um, Jennifer, I don't know if you have another question. Otherwise, there was something I was going to ask. Go ahead, Gordon. Okay, so this is a question, I mean, both for, uh, I think for John and Lisa primarily, um, and it predates COVID, but it but might be exacerbated about it, which is the question of staff shortages. I know that nationally about 40% of school teachers quit the profession within their first five years. Um, and lately many experienced educators have been quitting or taking early retirements due to the pressures on the job or the attacks on public pensions or other, co or other causes. I know there are states who, have responded to teacher shortages by saying, well, let's just lower the standards. And now anybody who went to college can teach even if they didn't study education. Or some states even now importing teachers from the Philippines and other countries like we import thousands of nurses from the Philippines and say, well, they'll, they'll be willing to work under conditions that, uh, that other people may not. 
So the question really is, should we be worrying about Oregon becoming the kind of state where a lot of the most talented, most educated staff end up leaving the profession of education because of pressures either prior to COVID or exacerbated by COVID? So Gordon, I can speak to Oregon specifically, but nationally as well. Just before all of this uh, started with the schools closing, the school buildings closing down, um, we, I was scheduled to go to an NEA conference, uh, a summit on, on teacher shortages. Um, that is a problem all across the country and it has really stemmed from um, the lack of respect for educators, the attacks on education, attacks on salary benefits, um, retirement. We just saw the PERS uh, decision that the legislator, legislature made be uh, upheld by the Supreme, Oregon Supreme Court which is going to further uh, damage uh, retirement benefits for, for educators. Um, but you know, we also had the, the part of social and emotional learning that wasn't being addressed, where um, young, especially K through five students were uh, exhibiting behaviors um, where they're biting, kicking, scratching. Uh, we've had teachers uh, going to the hospital with concussions, broken limbs, also instructional assistants uh, and other uh, school employees. Um, and, our teacher prep programs are at an all-time low for, for uh, enrollment. Uh, and that's true, not just in Oregon. In fact, that social and emotional piece and teacher prep programs, that's all across this nation. And in Oregon, we haven't lowered our standards yet, but we are finding it more and more difficult to recruit uh, people to the profession, especially diverse people to the profession, uh, which is a real big goal of ours is to make sure that our the faces of our educators match the faces of our students. And uh, uh, that is just uh, becoming more and more difficult. And now with uh, calling teachers and other staff back into work uh, and, and asking people to put their lives on the line, we're seeing more and more people either retire early or just simply quit the profession and say, we're gonna go do something else. I, I completely agree with that statement. We've been underfunded and over mandated to death. It's just relentless. And to have our own legislature in the past make decisions that are affecting our retirements now and for us to pick up that cost is absolutely ridiculous. It's, it's a tragedy and um, they need to figure out how to fix it because they've created this problem. And frankly, Classified staff don't get paid enough to put our lives on the line for those jobs. We love our children. Don't get me wrong. They want to work. They want to be there. I've had classified staff literally cry because they're missing their kids and they're worried about them. They're, they want to be with them. But not at the risk of losing grandma and grandpa. Not at the risk of being financially devastated and losing their homes because they've been out of work for two months from an illness that a normal flu would put you down for a week. It's, it's just not worth it. And um, they're, we're at a crisis and we need those people to do that with service, that work. So, thank you. Well, we, we just got a question that I think is directly relevant to that. So, somebody wrote in saying, my district is requiring all employees to report to work daily. Many of us are willing but have no childcare available or in the high risk categories or have family in their home in high risk categories. What options do we have? So it's one of the, one of the issues that we're working really hard on right now and we're trying to uh, work with COSA and OSBA, the Oregon School Boards Association and the School Administrators Group um, to, uh, to try to find uh, an answer to this. But we've also been encouraging our locals to negotiate childcare options with the district to allow for uh, child care benefit, at least temporarily while this is going on. Uh, but we're also saying, you know, um, what is the point of mandating every single employee to come into the building when those jobs can reasonably be done remotely, uh, especially in, in, you know, the current situation? Um, and really, it's, it, it boils down to uh, optics, right? They don't, want, they don't want people seeing uh, educators uh, in town during the day, or they, they want people to be able to drive by the school parking lot and see cars in the school parking lot. And at, at the end of the day, people should be able to volunteer to go in if the Wi-Fi is better at school, or, or if they have more access to their curriculum and they feel more comfortable delivering that from school. 
But to ask people to take unnecessary risks when they're high risk or when they live with people who are high risk is, is reprehensible in my opinion. Lisa, I assume you're dealing with this all over the state. Absolutely. And we have staff that are afraid of other staff who don't take it seriously. And that social distancing, wearing the masks, doing the things, because they're leaning into each other. And they're even if they're putting curriculum together, they need that space. And they're going to have to be really firm with it if they're going to come in. It's, there is no reason for you to be afraid of your coworker not re respecting your space. And so it is difficult, it is tough, um, but if you're getting paid and the work is being reasonable, there might be things that you can do, but you shouldn't be there just because somebody else thinks that you should be. Mm -hmm. it's, that's not right, so. Thanks. Um, uh, Diane, I, I wanted to get in one last question before we end here, which also kind of predates COVID, but maybe even more, um, relevant, which is about the balance between ideas about equity and ideas about standardization. Um, I, I know you've been a big critic of the overuse of standardized testing, and in, as have I, and in many places, you know, both in, especially in the online education technology, but even outside of that, schools seem like they're moving toward a point where, you know, if all seventh grade math teachers should be teaching the same thing on the same day, and that kind of argument is advanced often on the, as something done for equity reasons, that if we don't have test-driven standardized curriculum where everybody's doing the same thing, or like we were talking about earlier tonight, if we allow teachers to be experimental and educators to come up with whatever they think is the best way of doing things, that what we end up with is interesting classes for rich white kids and low expectations for everybody else. So I wanted to ask you how you see this balance between this kind of equity concern and the importance of teacher, of educator uh, autonomy and creativity? Well, you know, you know, after many years of thinking about this issue, and I used to be a huge uh, fan of sta standards. I didn't think of it as standardization, but standards have a, a, a nasty tendency to turn into standardization. Uh, and I think that the quintessence of this <clears throat> is the Common Core curriculum, because the Common Core curriculum is based on this belief that if everybody has the same curriculum and is studying the same thing on the same day, kind of like as you were describing it on page 412 on, on March 15th, uh, that that's equity. That's not equity. Uh, in fact, it's just boring. Uh, kids need to move at different paces and they have different interests. And what, what I think is foolish is to believe that if everybody studies the same thing at the same pace, they'll all come out in the same spot. And the, the, the kids who have the most and the kids who have the least will somehow be equalized by having this standard curriculum and standard test. And we know that this is, we've had enough experience over the past 10 years with the Common Core curriculum and, and Common Core standards to know that this doesn't work that way at all. And in fact, even in the same classroom with the same teacher and uh, who's doing the same thing, the kids will still have a very broad array of, of outcomes because they have a, they come in at different points and they have different interests. So standardization is just a, in education is a very stupid idea. Uh, it doesn't work. It, it's meaningless. And uh, what you described is the worst case scenario, which is the rich kids get interesting stuff and the poor kids get a dumbed down uh, lockstep curriculum. That's where we are now. So all the standardization has produced what you describe as the worst possible outcome. The best possible outcome would be if everybody were getting interesting, engaging lessons, if everybody had highly qualified teachers, if everyone uh, had challenging assignments that was at their own level and that encouraged them to want to delve deeper into the topic on their own. In other words, if, if we were if every child had the uh, ability to be inspired by intrinsic motivation rather than by the fear of a low test score or, or the teacher's fear of having getting a bad evaluation. Uh, what I've come to believe is that in education, um, carrots and sticks don't work. Uh, this is what you use. Carrots and sticks are great for donkeys, but teachers and children are not donkeys. And learning should be a joyful experience and it's not joyful when you're working under 
conditions of duress. And um, so I, I would say that the standardization has proven to be a failure. And in, my, in the book, my last book, which came out the day that COVID started in this country, January 21st, I have a chapter on motivation uh, that shows that no tell left behind was a failure. Uh, race to the top was a failure. Everything that succeeded, it was a failure. We've had 20 years and really 25 years of trying to uh, whip teachers into shape. And all we've managed to do is demoralize them and to uh, force children to get higher test scores. And the test scores went flat about 10 years ago. So this has been a very bad experiment. And we had, I hope that when, when things get back someday to who knows if they'll ever be normal, that they're not the same. That we should, we should aim to, re, to really reimagine our school system, not as one that's driven by uh, carrots and sticks, but one that has at its root uh, the pursuit of genuine education, real learning, the things that motivate kids, the things that get kids uh, eager to come to school because they're engaged in something that they love doing. And that's every teacher's dream. And I think that's a dream that we all have to hope for. The other point I wanted to make in response to the previous conversation is that one of the great concerns I have at this moment is before the COVID, before all of this started, there had already been a, a, a collapse of enrollment and teacher education programs. Uh, all over the country, this was happening and it started happening a few years ago because of disrespect for teachers, demonization of teachers, uh, Gates, uh, Bill Gates funded projects, Eli Broad funded projects, all of which were based on the assumption that teachers were needed to be weeded out and punished and on all this nonsense. And so we've had a very negative approach to the people who should be the most valued in our society, our teachers. And now the COVID has caused many teachers, especially those over the age of 50 to say, um, dare I go back into the classroom? If, if they're gonna force me to go back and my parents are living with me, I have an, a, someone, either I am, am compromised or someone in my household is compromised, I can't take that risk. And I'm very fearful that we're going to face a huge wave of retirements. And when you add that to the loss of enrollments in education programs, we're going to face a genuine crisis. And, and it won't be just a teacher shortage. It will be uh, uh, a desert where we really have to begin to pay much higher salaries, not lower standards, but higher salaries in order to attract people to return to education and to recognize it is. A, a highly valuable profession in our society. Great. Well, thank you. We're we're at the end of our time. Thank you so much, Diane Ravitch. And um, for listeners to hear to hear and read more of Diane Ravitch's insights, you can go to dianeravitch.net. Um, and thank you, John Larson and Lisa Gorley, really all three of you, not just for being here tonight, but for all the work you're doing for public education at this critical time. The, the next talk in the series will be um, Wednesday, August 26th, when we'll hear a wrap up of what happened in the Oregon legislature and, and where the state budget is at. Otherwise, thank you everyone for being part of this tonight. Thank you, thank you, Gordon. Wonderful to talk with you and wonderful to be with my, my co-panelists. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you.